Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning to those who are joining us online. Let's pray. Lord, some of us have known you a long time. Some of us here just a short while. And some don't know you yet. We pray, Lord, that because of today, all of us would know you better. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, please do turn to the psalm that was read in Psalm 116. And today we come with a mixture of emotions. We come to mourn an earthly life that has ended. We come to celebrate a life that was well lived. And we come to honor a life that was laid down in service. And I want to frame my uh, meager, inadequate comments, really, around that reading in Psalm 116. And this was one of the set psalms, the set songs that Jesus and his disciples sang at the Last Supper. And it was a song that gave meaning and gave hope as the long shadows fell. And today it speaks to us as we stand in the shadow of the death of our dear Queen. Repeatedly in this psalm, we find the word serve, service, and servant. The psalmist writes, I serve you as my mother did. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of your faithful servant. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. And preeminently, Queen Elizabeth II was a servant queen. One of her family mottos that we can see on our two pence pieces is the, the German declaration, Ich dien, I serve. And she faithfully and sacrificially served us for 70 years and 214 days. She served the Commonwealth. She served Great Britain and Northern Ireland. She served the church. And preeminently, she served her Lord. Andrew, who's a member of our church here, St. Aldate's, was recipient two years ago of the Queen's Maundy money. It was during lockdown and the Queen was unable to give it herself and uh, sent the Maundy money with a letter that she wrote and she signed. And this is what the Queen wrote. This ancient Christian ceremony, which reflects Jesus' instructions to his disciples to love one another, is a call to the service of others. Something, she wrote, that it has been at the center of my life. And I believe it is the call, she says, to us all to serve others. And so today, as we remember our wonderful queen, she presents us with an inspiration as a role model and also a challenge. And the question before us is, who do we serve? And how are we serving? And what will we live for? I want to just make three short points from our psalm. First, our servant queen unceasingly promoted the God she served. It says in verse 13, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. And that is what she did. Every year in her Christmas message, the Queen never failed to tell out her soul the greatness of her God. She had a living faith and a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ that she promoted and made known on all occasions to as many people as she could. Christmas 2002, she said, the only way to live 
is to put my trust in God. In 2011, she said, I have been and remain grateful to God for his steadfast love. So it's not just some cerebral or intellectual or rational faith in God. This was a personal and intimate relationship with God through Jesus in the experience of his steadfast love. 2014, she said, For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, whose birth we celebrate, is an inspiration and the anchor of my life. What a woman, and what a faith, and what a God. What is the anchor of your life? Today, as we remember her, we need to be inspired by her faith. My grandfather loved the Queen and kept two photographs of her in his wallet. He always wore a blazer, and he kept it on the inside pocket of his blazer over his heart. But it seems to me that the Queen held Jesus close to her heart. And at one Christmas message, she encouraged us all. She said, what are we to give to Jesus? Give him your heart. Give him your heart. She did. And hers was no mere personal and privatized faith, but it was one that she went public on, that she promoted to others, because she was confident in the gospel, in the good news that Jesus Christ saves. 2011 Christmas message, she said, forgiveness lies at the heart of the Christian faith. What a wonderful thing she understood, that God, through Jesus, forgives our sin. There's nowhere else to go. And nothing we do can cover the wrong that we've done. But she knew that Jesus forgives our sin. And then she said this, God sent a saviour with the power to forgive. How wonderful is that? For 70 years, we sang God Save the Queen. And he did. And she knew it. And she loved it. And she lived it. And she heralded it. And she wanted others to know the God who loves and the God who forgives And the God who saves. Again, 2017 Christmas message. She said, Christmas shows us that God's love is for everyone. High born or low. She says there is no one beyond its reach. No one. Our queen was an evangelist. One of her official titles was defender of the faith. And she took that title seriously and just as she herself in a gentle way as it were lifted up the cup of salvation lifted it up offered it out and invited others to drink of it so she encouraged the church never to lose sight of it to remember what we are here for to lift up to hold out to offer up to give to others the cup of salvation As Supreme Governor of the Church of England, at the opening of General Synod in November 2021, she was poorly, but she wrote an address and she gave it to her son Edward to read. And she reminded the bishops of the Church of England, she said, Christ's teaching and the gospel remain unchanged. Don't meddle with it. Don't mess with it. It's perfect as it is. It is unchanging. And there's nowhere else to go to meet the God of love who saves, restores, and heals, and delivers, and forgives, and opens up heaven. And then she said, among the many duties of the church, one stands out as supreme to bring the people of this country to the knowledge and love of God. That was her word, her final word to the Church of England, whose head she is under the Lord Jesus. 
our responsibility, our duty, and our privilege to hold out the cup of salvation to the people of this land and bring them to the knowledge and the experience of God's love. And church, I want to say this morning that this is the time, like our queen, to offer up and to hold out the cup of salvation. Maybe you have, as it were, metaphorically never drunk of it yourself. This is a good day to do that. This is a good day to say, I want to know this God that the Queen knew. And I want to serve this God that the Queen served. And I want to experience this love that our Queen experienced. And I want to know this forgiveness. And I want to know this salvation that is offered through Jesus. This is a day for that. It's also a day for us as the church, we who have drunk, who know this, to be those who are encouraged and renewed in our holding out again. We've already mentioned the Alpha Course starting on the 4th of October. What a wonderful event. Why not come? Bring your friends who are asking questions. and Bring them to learn more about this cup of salvation. That's the first thing. Secondly, our servant queen fulfilled her vows to God and nation. Verse 14 in our psalm says... I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Elizabeth had already been queen for 13 years when I was born. In 1982, at the age of 16, I joined the Coldstream Guards, the oldest oldest British Army regiment. And uh, sadly, I was invalided out, but if I hadn't have been, I might never have become a priest. But on enlisting, and being accepted into the British Army, you're paid the Queen's shilling, it's called. It was about a fiver then, a couple of packs of fags. And I remember publicly at the age of 16 having to take an oath to the Queen. These are the words I said. I swear by Almighty God that I will bear faithful and true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, and that I will, as in duty bound, honestly and faithfully defend Her Majesty, her heirs and successors in person, crown and dignity against all enemies, and will observe and obey all. And it meant a great deal to me then. Never regretted it. Three times since then, I've had to reaffirm that vow to the queen when I was ordained first a deacon, and then when I was ordained a priest, and then when I was inducted as a university chaplain. But you know, many took oaths to the queen, but the queen took an oath to God and to many. On her 21st birthday, she made a radio speech She said, I declare that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service. She was addressing the Commonwealth. God help me to make good my vow. She vowed to the nations a vow under God. Six years later at a coronation, she recalled... When I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. I do not retract nor regret one word of it. She was a woman who took a vow to all to serve under the God she served. About a week ago, Stephen, our rector, sensed that our queen was soon to die. And he said to me, Simon, I'd like you to start preparing a talk. I said, really? He said, yeah, I think she doesn't have long. Start writing a sermon. And then last Thursday morning, early in the morning, I woke up and I thought, I must write a sermon today. That morning I got into work early and began writing this sermon. And then some five hours later, Stephen rings and says, it's happening. When I was writing the sermon early on Thursday morning, I felt the Holy Spirit nudge me to look up 
the meaning of the name Elizabeth. So I got into work and I looked it up. And it's a Hebrew name. It's a biblical name. Eli Sheba or Sheba. Eli or Eli means my God. And Shiva means oath or vow. Literally can be translated, my God is my vow. The psalmist says, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And for 70 years and 214 days, our queen kept her vow. She'd made an oath and she never reneged on it. She never regretted it. She never recanted it, but she lived it out fully. Hers was an avowed life, a life serving others because first she served God and she served with dignity and fidelity, tiring of, but never retiring. In the last two days of her life, she was still exercising responsibilities and duties of her office, welcoming a new prime minister. And God kept his oath. His oath that he made swearing upon himself because there was no one higher. And an oath to give life to those who looked to him. And he has brought her, as he promised, into eternal rest in heaven. Maybe today is the day for you to make an oath. For you to vow to serve others because first and foremost, you choose today to serve God. It was George Whitfield, I believe, who attended the college there, Pembroke, just across the way, a great leader of the church in the early 18th century, who said, if I cannot serve God one way, I will another. I will never leave off this blessed service. And then thirdly and finally, our servant queen received a royal welcome into heaven's throne room. I love verse 15 in our psalm. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Why precious? To whom precious? Precious to the Lord because he delights in welcoming his children home and into the fullness of all that he's prepared for them. Our queen lived in some remarkable places. I expect they were a bit drafty. Windsor, and <laughs> Buckingham Palace and Balmoral. It's an amazing thing. This psalm tells us that God is not aloof. God is not indifferent. God is not absent. God is not distant. We matter to him. Not just royalty, but all us who are ordinary. We matter. And he calls us precious. And he wants to give us life with him forever. How do we know we're precious to him? Because he's already given us the best thing that he had to save us. His own son, Jesus. On Thursday afternoon, the nation held its breath as we learned that the Queen was bidding her last farewell. We didn't know it would be so imminent and immediate, but her family were rushed to her bedside and journalists were prepared around the world and arrangements for services were sent out and events and public announcements were sketched out and so on. And the nation held its breath and braced itself for this news. But what we didn't see was what was happening in eternity and in heaven and in that more real place. And under the orders of the King of Kings, angels were being marshaled and a red carpet rolled out for the welcome home of one of God's children. The Jesus she, she served. The Jesus who the queen every night spoke to. We read she would slip out of bed and kneel 
down and pray. There on that bed, the Lord Jesus came to bring her home with those words that we read in Scripture, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your master. Thursday night, my father wrote to me, and he loved the queen like his dad. And he told me that when my mum was a mayor, town mayor, she was invited to a formal dinner with some other worthies, uh, dinner with the queen and Prince Philip. And my father was seated on the next table to the queen next to the bodyguard. I don't know if the bodyguard was worried about my old man or what. Uh, but my mum has never forgiven my dad because mum was the mayor with all her gold and dangling stuff and she had to sit on a table far away. But you know, our queen, I was thinking Thursday night, our queen is now in heaven. And she is seated with the king of kings at that great banquet. But you might be asking, how can you be so confident? How can you make such claims? And the answer is because God says so. God was her oath. She relied on the love of God. She put her trust in Jesus who came to save. This was the foundation and the inspiration of her life. She told everyone, millions of people every year and we saw that her life backed it up she believed the gospel that she told, told the church was unchanging she had drunk of that cup of salvation that she said the church must always hold out she believed the gospel that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. God, the etern Jesus, the eternal Son of God, is, becomes flesh and lives amongst us and is born to die. And there in the mystery and agony of Calvary, the loveliest life the world has ever known goes into the heart of darkness and takes upon himself the punishment for the sins of the whole world. And there he in himself bears the price for our sin. And there he cancels and annuls the judgment on our sin. And he's laid in a tomb. And three days later he rises again. His death was sufficient. And it deals with our sin. And it opens up access to heaven. And all who believe and trust in him receive that salvation from him and are guaranteed in eternity in a party in heaven the queen knew it the queen loved it the queen lived by it the queen offered it and today the greatest way we can honor her is to honor the god that she lived to honor and say yes to him you know, we, I sat down earlier and I see we've got a building, we've got a crane here. We're going through some building, necessary building work at the moment. And that crane says on the side in huge letters, Upward Powered Access. <laughs> I really like that. It's for doing the lights and upward powered access. But that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Most of us will never have, had, never have had access to to the queen but the queen points us to the access that is available to us of the king of kings if we believe and trust as she did amen